Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special episode of the Play On podcast. This will hopefully be the first of many interviews. And the first guest that I have on is Dublin under-20 footballer, Sean Fawn. Sean, how's it going? Hi, Sean. How are you? Good, good. Um, so, for those who don't know, Sean is on the Dublin under-20 footballers. He has been for, this is his third year now. And he scored the goal, which was the decisive score, really, in Dublin's victory over Wicklow there last week. But, Sean, you went off with a shoulder injury. How's the shoulder keeping now? Um, yeah, so I went to Bowman that night and got a scan. Uh, thankfully, there's no dislocation or fracture. Um, I was back in the surgery clinic the following day. Um, so, so far, I got told that's the possibility of a grade five chair um, on the AC joint, so two ligaments basically. Um, just tore at the moment but yeah um, healing quite well um, a few days on later now and yeah I can't complain hopefully it's a matter of just how the body heals naturally and I'll be back as soon as possible yeah definitely so let's go back to the very start then so you started your career you're with Whitehall Column Kills can you remember what exactly drew you into the sport or was it just always something that you were meant to do if you like was it just something that was part of your life or do you remember pursuing Gaelic games yourself um I suppose that the main thing was that no one really in my family played it before me and um, my sisters got involved after me or whatever but initially it was just kind of I went up um with my two uncles or whatever start training and I suppose what attracted me to it was that you never you're never going to be the ideal footballer. You're never going to be your complete footballer. Um, we had a meeting last week and someone on the team put it into perspective as a jigsaw puzzle. So Gaelic or any sport, it's it's all about collecting the parts. So you're going to start at hopefully age four or five and play to whatever age um, the body allows. But over that time, you're never going to be the ideal footballer or the dream footballer you think you will be. And even if you can't, there's no limit to how good um, you can get. So I suppose what attracted me to it is that the whole thing, I love seeing, I love seeing progress and definitely over perfection. That's, that's certainly, but um, I suppose just the small details and the minor things that you can do to, uh, to improve um, from day to day, from week to week, from year to year. And then I suppose having these goals that, you know, they are achievable. It's a matter of hundred percent of the, the uh, responsibility is down to you and how you want to achieve that, how badly and how much you're willing to do to put that, that goal ahead of everything else. Yeah, no, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And progress over perfection is definitely something that everyone should really aim for in whatever field that they are in. Um, was there ever a stage, you know, when you were growing up, was there ever a stage where you were more interested in a different sport or was it gone hurling all the way for you? Um, I think that it was... It was mainly Gaelic and hurling. Um, at a very young age, I didn't enjoy hurling. I thought it was probably, um, I probably didn't get to grips with the sport itself at the time. Um, came home black and blue after games, and I suppose I probably preferred football back then. And then I suppose under 16s and minors, definitely hurling was their priority. And then up until I think I went into fourth year, where basketball would have been a huge, uh, huge love of mine. And then I think. It was nothing really else because the problem was we were training so much three or four times a week um, in each code. So you, you kind of you wouldn't even have time really to think about another sport. But no, I suppose I've, I've my dad to thank that he never really put me into soccer. He was always more towards Gaelic. So I probably have him to thank for that anyways. Yeah, definitely. No, and definitely, you know, the influence of parents is definitely something that goes underrated in terms of mm -hmm. what sport you get put into. But so... You got put on Whitehall Column Kills and that Whitehall Column Kill crop that you ended up playing in the minors, you know, has produced as well as yourself, the likes of Lee Gannon and Endo Donald, who, you know, various Dublin teams, very successful crop. You know, me, yourself and I were both part of that Whitehall crop that won the failure, that won, you know, made records really with the club. Did that breed a real winning mentality that you've carried into the Dublin um, yeah, I think it did, to be honest. I think it helped. Um, but again, the problem is you can be part of a winning team, as we see with a load of lads, but then they, they feel when they get to another, let's say, uh, environment that they don't have to work as hard because 
um, they're mixing with different people that they probably don't get along as well with. But no, I, def- I definitely do think it helped. Um, there was only three teams I've ever played with, uh, no matter how bad the game has gone, and you feel like you're still going to win. So that would have been the Whitehall 2000s and 2001s when they amalgamated that minor. Um, it would definitely have been the Dublin under-20s last year. And then I think the last team would have been that college's hurling team that I played on in 20... It was 2019 I played on. Um, we ended up beating Kieran's College that day down in in Leash. And I suppose it's yeah, it's anything that when you're repeatedly winning, um, it becomes nearly a second nature or a habit to you. And that's hopefully what you can maintain. Yeah, definitely. And while you're winning all these things down with Whitehall, like the Division One title and so on, you also got selected for Dublin right from the beginning. So right from the trials, you were a dual player. You played football and hurling all the way up. And then, obviously, you stopped playing hurling as you got to the, the 20s. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so there was four lads. So there, there probably would have been about, I'd say, 17 or 18 lads in total that were doing dual at the year minor in 2018. And everyone basically was made pick. And they asked me to pick and they asked the three other lads that done it with me to pick that year. Um, but I kind of held off. There's a kind of a funny story that I actually went to. I rang Jason Sherlock to tell him I was actually going to pick football. Or sorry, to pick hurling. And that day, in that particular time, uh, he went to voicemail and I says, ah, he'll ring me back. And he never rang me back that day. And then uh, I never actually had to choose. So it was myself, Luke Swan, Connor Murray and Liam Dunn. Um, but then you can kind of see after minor how it takes a toll on the body and I suppose it's just not maintainable to do both at the same time um, and it can cause quite conflict and you're, you're probably not fully committed to one but I suppose that's the joy of when you go back to play with Whitehall or you play with the club you're week on week off football and hurling and it's, it's a, I think it's a lovely mix um, for myself anyways yeah yeah no like playing the both sports definitely you know helps you enjoy them individually more it, it stops it getting too serious but you know as you're competing at the top then you know in your juvenile obviously you know obviously you're going to get have a bit of a rivalry with the teams that you're playing against at the top and then you're selected with these other top players to go into the Dublin team how did you manage to kind of was it a mutual thing or did you ever say look like whatever happened on the pitch there between you and me kind of stays there like we have a Dublin jersey on now or was it kind of unspoken um, I think I probably think yeah it's it's funny like I think about it now when we played against Sylvester's and you look at Josh Mann and Sean Gordon, um, Simon Murphy and then you look at Castle Lock the likes of probably David Bowen and and Connor Chalk of football and all these lads you probably um, you had big enough fights and stuff on the pitch but I suppose that is the the aim is where you want to be competing is at the top I suppose and at the highest level that's possible for you Um. And in order to do that, I think every piece of the chain or the puzzle or whatever needs to come together. So, for example, if I'm trying to look better than, let's say, Gideon are playing in the same line, he's going to try to do the same. And then you probably both won't play to your max. And then the team isn't succeeding in that either. So there's definitely a mix of, of selflessness. And then I suppose just... I think I think it's as well. It's it's just growing up. I think is a, a certain element of it. You think these lads are probably a lot worse than they are, and then they're still lads that are 13, 14 years of age when you come together, or the north and the south and hurling, um, and you copy with a lot of similarities. You're probably going through the same stuff. You're in the same year and skill. So there's probably more um, there's more common dom- denominators than you'd actually think. Yeah. No. Definitely. And so. Then, of course, you made the minor team in both codes. Um, was there ever a stage when you felt like you might get cut? Um, there was cuts in the football. I think it was uh, about 11 days before the first championship game, which would have been against Loud. Because that was Lorcan O'Dell, of course. He, he got cut, what, didn't he, just before the yeah. start of minor? Yeah, exactly. So you'd, you'd have lads like Lorcan O'Dell. Uh, you, you had Ryan Murphy, Robert Halpin. Um, so again, some of these lads were cutting. That was probably their their initial reaction was to step away, walk away from it, and 
and that's fine, I suppose. But other lads, like you, like you mentioned there, Lork, and he came back stronger and fitter than ever. And I think that definitely the two years with Temple Old playing with the likes of Ono Gara, or Ono Gara, not a Scully, and these kind of uh, physically bigger lads, definitely. Um, he adjusted to how he had to play the game, to his specific uh, tactics. And I think... I think that's a huge part. I think it's one of the most under um, under recognised things is when players do play two years at senior level or a year at senior level. How the actual pace of the game, transition of the game, the speed of the game is so much faster than what you're playing at minor. So yeah, I, I would definitely think. I don't think there was. I was really ever nervous of getting cut off when I thought if it happened, I still have one. Um, but again, I think I needed that mix of football and hurling week on week off because. I was still only, but I, well, I thought I was still young, but I thought that's that is what I needed at that moment in time. Yeah, no, definitely. And so then you got in, so you were starting for the footballers. And one thing I remember about that team was there was a lot of lads who were playing in positions that they wouldn't have played for for their club teams. Now, the the one that jumped out to me back then was Adam Veeran of Scaries Harps. You know, would never have played fullback for Scaries Harps when we played against them, and he was shoehorned in there, if you like. Now, he did a good job, but he was always more of a wing-back, and now he's playing midfield for the under-20s. And yourself as well, you were midfield, wing-forward for us, and they had you in a corner-forward, sometimes at full-forward. Did it? Did you find it hard at all to adapt to that position, especially because you were playing much further out the field for Whitehall? Did you find it hard to switch? I think I was definitely wasn't in, probably a natural corner-forward. I thought I always had... I was coming off after games and probably saying, I don't feel like I've got a full stretch of my legs because I suppose more of the running you do is short and sharp kind of things. Um, but if you look through that team as well, you had the likes of, let's say, Sean Bowen and goal. That was a goalkeeper as well, okay. But he played full forward for Whitehall. You would have Mark Lavin at wing back and it was his natural position, yet still got footballer of the year. And then you had likes of... Um, you would have had Enda Cashman, which was the captain that year. Um, playing centre forward one game the following game we played against Mead I think it was centre back and we played in the middle of the field as well um, and you'd have like you said Adam Fair and a full back which actually went into the midfield and it's funny because I was just thinking about Jason Shillock there the other day and the main points or whatever he kind of would say to us was it's all about progress and development was a huge factor for him and he had this saying when he was involved with the double seniors that year so he went into games convinced that 90% of the game will be won on preparation. So if you can nail the hydration, uh, I suppose the mental state going in for a game and the carb load and all the small things that add up, um, he reckoned that 90% of the win in the end was in the preparation that was done 24 hours to 48 hours beforehand. Yeah, no, that definitely preparation is absolutely huge. Like prepare to f- fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And of course, the first championship game for that Dublin minor team was against Loud in Parnell Park. Now, obviously, that would have been your first time playing in a Dublin jersey where obviously you'd had the competitions before, but that would have been the first time which would have got national attention. That would have got, you know, fans down who maybe don't know you personally. And, you know, they're judging you from a complete spectator's view. And how did you feel the night before that game, knowing that all your work really, this is that that was the biggest game of your career to that day? Um, yeah, I suppose it's, it's a mixture probably of, of uh, good nerves and then of hoping that you can fulfil your tasks, I suppose. Um, I suppose I, I wasn't that... We were playing games for so long with each other beforehand that I kind of, I don't try to get focused in and too focused in any one game. Um, okay, I was, I actually, I think I scored two or three points that day, which probably helped going into the next game. But as in, um, I wouldn't say nervous. I'd say buzzing is a, is a word. Um, I'm nearly dreading the day before matches because I'm, I'm nearly too, too wound up and too buzzed to, that I actually want to go. But again, I think it's a huge part, especially now in GAA, that you have to try to find the balance between the amount of energy you're going to use physically and then mentally. You can watch all the video analysis you want and write all the stuff you want down. Um, but again, you have to remember that this is going to take its toll on your head. 
Um, and I think once you're going in with an attitude that everything that you can control and that you can manage and dictate is done hopefully 24 hours before, if not definitely the day um, of the game is done. Um, and that, that, that could be something as simple as sorting the route that needs to be sorted out or it's going over your tactics board again. Maybe it's just getting the hydration into you. But I think once you give yourself the best chance, um, your football and your ability and your talent and your work, work ethic will um, definitely, hopefully, get you over the line. Yeah, definitely. And, of course, the game being in Parnell Park as well, you know, I do remember all the finals that Whitehall had, you know, as we were growing up down in Parnell Park and a lot of, you know, Whitehall members would come down and, you know, the crowd would be quite big for those finals. Did that definitely, I'd say that that definitely helped you because, you know, it wasn't something that you were doing for the very first time. You know, you could almost imagine that it's a club game just yeah. you're playing for Dublin. Yeah. Um, I suppose that the one game that really, I think, struck a bell with me was the minor championship final. Um, we were first year minor and it was in 2018, I think, if I'm right. And it was against Bally Bowden. Um, I think that was one of the days that was probably definitely my best sport memory, I think, anyways, by a long while. It's funny, like, if you've, you've lads running over to you after the full-time whistle. And I just, actually, funny, I remember seeing, it was Kerry Hannon, his granddad, his dad, him, and then his little brother. So I just thought this is nearly, it's three generations here today. Um, and it meant so much to everyone, I suppose, and, it's just, I don't know, like it's it's moments that don't really, no matter what level you're playing at, they don't come around that often. Um, there's only one trophy, max two or three to be won a year. So every, every little thing, I suppose, helps. But yeah, I think it definitely helped me. And to be honest with you, nerves are a brilliant thing, I think. But again, once the ball's in and the game is on within the first minute, two minutes, you forget where you are and you're just zoned in. And again, it's down to completing your individual tasks and the collective tasks and that's what it's about yeah and speaking of Kerry Hannon we can't bring his name up with context in that game without mentioning his winning goal I just remember seeing him get the ball on the 21 and we all knew he was going to go for it and that's one of the best goals you know yeah at such yeah. a clutch time and yeah that won the minor championship for Whitehall absolutely amazing finish from him Obviously, yourself now, I'd say that you got there purely from your hard work. What drives you? What's the, what's the main motivation for you? Um, what is it? I, I think, I probably think I'm, um, my dad would definitely have a, a bit of a factor in this in terms of like he'd always, even when I was younger, probably say, if you're not going to do something right, don't do it. And he would fully mean that whether it be as something as small as a job in the house or whether it be football or whatever. So um definitely think that's I just don't I just don't if I'm gonna have to something I'd rather not be there and um, save your time, save other people's time. Again, I think the motivation will just come back to again the image of the jigsaw puzzle that you're never gonna complete it. But again, you're gonna strive if you strive for perfection, you'll get progress. You won't ever get perfection. And um, there's like to Paul Flynn on the One Percent podcast, Shay Dalton. He talks about he's never played the perfect game. So if he's never played the perfect game, I don't think anyone else is near it. And then I suppose a team when you're creating a culture um, or an environment, um, that that it's a mix of you have to have the social aspects with the sporting aspect. So I would be definitely in favour of nowadays, particularly, um you need to find the right balance. And I think I struggle with that definitely. Um, but I know other lads do. So for example, last year, after all the Dublin games, they were 10 days apart, whatever. I didn't find anything wrong with going and let's say having the point or two in a different place. And I think it's actually just to settle down, relax. And remember, look at the bigger picture. It's a, it's a privilege and it's an honour to to play with Whitehall, to play with the 20s, to play with any team. Um, and I think... It all happened it genuinely when I think of minor now, that's three years ago. It goes so fast. So I just think you have to celebrate the wins um, and celebrate the losses as well. And it doesn't mean 
I suppose going on the rip or going on the tear. But it, again, it's all about finding the balance and the whole thing. Then again, of you're never gonna never gonna reach perfection, but you can definitely progress a hell of a lot if you put your head down. Yeah, definitely. And speaking of that year for you and minor, so of course you were playing the football and you were playing the hurling and the, the two codes seemed to take, you know, different routes. You know, the football, obviously you started that day off with a good victory against Loud, but that football championship for Dublin kind of ended in heartbreak in Leinster. Whereas on the other side, you just won an absolute epic in the hurling final against Kilkenny and won Dublin the Leinster title. Now I know that you just went out in the semi-final to Galway, but you know, how did you how did you deal with, you know, kind of the lowest of lows in the football and then almost the highest of highs in the hurling? Um, yeah, well, it's funny. Every time I compare them two years, I'd probably I would definitely think I learned more um that year. I'm probably more educated that year in football rather than hurling. Um why I think that would definitely I think just two different, very different types of style of management. So, like, again, back down to, like, J.O., uh, it's the development, it's the progression. Um, and he was genuinely down to, these are here to have fun. And after minor, it does get very serious. So make sure this is the right decision you want to make. Whereas I think the hurl, you can tell by it, if you look at the, the hurling now, a lot of players go straight from minor to senior, whereas that, that's not the case in football in Dublin at the moment. Um, you look at the likes of, let's say, even Darren Mullins that was playing there in his first game for against Ross Common. Like he, not many lads would notice, but he's in the gym probably three, four times a week, and, and then with a mix of pitch sessions, and that's probably going on the last three years. But again, he's only getting time in the league, and then hopefully, it's just building, and building, and building, and building. Um, oh, definitely. But, like Sean yeah. McMahon is the one that I look at as Sean McMahon has been. A class player for DCU for years and he was very good on the Dublin underage teams and Dublin are only looking at him this year after he's been top class for about four or five years yeah and I think I think that's that's the whole thing it's again it's development over anything else I think I developed more at minor than I did probably in the football setup than I did in the minor setup and whether that or the, the hurling and whether that be from even personal perspective I think um, remember that year was it the, the junior shirt or something it wasn't even bad at the time but I just remember actually just thinking, getting stressed over says I can't do both sports I can't do both sports but then you have to ask yourself again how badly do you really want it and then thankfully um, I was able to get help in, in certain subjects and stuff off them um, and again that, that probably stood more with me than winning the Leinster title or that year, I probably learned more in football wise. So that I, I would think the football stood out for me more that year. And then again, it's all about the right mix. We probably went out more as a team. I think we only had one night out to hurling because the lads over Dublin at that time now can't drive, and so it's such a split divide between north and south. So I suppose the football was the majority of us were from the north side, and we went out and we went and we'd done activity, I suppose, outside the training ground, which I think as well is as important as whatever happens on the pitch. Yeah, definitely. And so then you went from the minors and you got onto the Dublin under 20s then, which was a very, very good achievement because that Dublin under 20 team was, you know, loaded with talent. You're talking about the likes of Padre Coffey Byrne now, who've gone on to the Dublin seniors, those types of guys, James Dorn and the like. But you, you managed to get onto that team at a time when, you know, during 2019, when of course you were doing your leave insert. And then you had, you know, your first year in college coming up. You know, so many things in your life are changing at the one time. And yet, you know, the Dublin, I imagine, is requiring a lot of effort and a lot of commitment. How did you manage to balance studying, playing for Dublin and then kind of settling into college life? Yeah, I think definitely sixth year was the toughest year um, for me anyways, uh, off the field probably more than on it but I, th I suppose multiple lads like that isn't there um, I suppose all over the country or whatever but why did I I thought Gaelic would be more of a get out of jail card from studying and stuff like that probably um, I wouldn't say I'm a huge huge academic at school or, or anything like it but I think as well I I wasn't bad either um, I wanted to 
get the points I had to get if I wanted to go to college, which I initially didn't. And I knew that even if I did, it wasn't going to be a huge demand for points wise. And um, again, thankfully, I got got the points. Um, thanks to probably a hand from DCU. And again, where I was, they accommodated me in playing football out there. But I don't think I would have got that if I hadn't have played that year. And um, I definitely learned loads of tips and tricks. Probably that there's a huge gap between minors and 20s. Um, and I think the likes of Don Ryan, Ono D, uh, you have James Kelvin, Leo Matthews, all these lads that, in fairness, they were very, very helpful. Um, and I'm forever grateful for that kind of assistance, especially when I was one of the only lads on that team that actually played that year. Um, so, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And so after that year, of course, you went into your second year as a Dublin under-20 footballer and you won the Leinster title. Of course, it, that is another medal in your pocket, which I'm sure you're delighted with. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. Yeah, um, we had, I think it was, it ended up being, was it a six-week break between the Leinster final and the All-Ireland semi-final against Tyrone up in Breffney Park? Um it was, it was the worst. I think the worst part about it was that all the lads even had this discussion that was, it's all, it's all like waves. So you'd be really motivated one day and then you could be down in the slums the next day or vice versa. And it's kind of hard to motivate the other lads around you. Um, all through Zoom or online. Um, so yeah, I definitely, definitely think it stood to me having that break or whatever. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I would, I wouldn't like to go back to having that long of a gap again. But it, you definitely learn a lot more about yourself, probably on and off the field, than what you would think. Yeah, and you came back into that Tyrone game now. In you know, you were still as fit as ever, and you were right up to the pace of it. How did you manage to keep yourself? driven, motivated and fit? Was it home workouts? Was it diets? Was it, you know, getting into going for jogs? Yeah, I I think I remember the first time initially even getting up to that spot. I think it was, I used to go on, I used to do a gym session in the morning and then the run at night. And it didn't have to be a long run or it didn't have to be a hard gym session. But it, the main thing is every night I could tick the box saying, yeah, I've done all I can. Um, especially I thought I, as a GA player you rarely get the six weeks off so I thought it'd be a really really good time to work on mobility work and um, I started doing a mobile for life program um, injury prevention and all that kind of stuff I definitely think it helped yoga meditation all that kind of sort of stuff probably different aspect of Gaelic but yeah that's it. That's how I kept busy um, and then obviously thankfully I'm in a job where I work outside and I was doing bits and bobs here and there um, as well to keep busy and to keep the hours of the day just ticking away. Yeah, no, definitely. And you beat Tyrone in that semi-final, a very, very talented Tyrone team. You know, that Tyrone team, of course, had Dara Canavan on it. And that was an excellent game. It was, you know, a titanic struggle between the two teams. And then you got into the All-Ireland final against Galway. And to lose that game by a point, you know, I'd say that must have been heartbreaking. Is there any major lessons that you've taken from that game? I think probably as a group or as a collective unit, I suppose, just being adaptable is probably a skill that you can't teach. But yeah, but if you could do that, definitely. Galway and stuff like that had our kick out nailed to a tee. They were brilliant. I think we're very fast in Gaelic nowadays to point the finger and blame ourselves, but it's it's you have to give other teams and stuff like that credit. Yeah, it was it was definitely an experience. Um, I was probably more frustrated at the, on the actual day that I didn't get on, stuff like that. But again, I can't complain. I got every other minute of every other game as well. So, um, learned a lot. Hurt for a while after, but then again, it's you play sport because the highs are highs and then the lows are lows. So that's why we're all here. Yeah, and no doubt that Galway team was, you know, stacked with talent. You look at the likes of Matthew Tierney, of course, he's been Galway's standout player for them in the championship so far. He was outstanding against Roscommon in the semi-final. And then you look, obviously, Tom O'Cullhan was on that team. Jack Lynn was on that team. You know, he did an outstanding job on Kieran Archer on the day. 
is it, you know, obviously you've played against Dara Canavan, you've played against Matthew Tierney, as I've said. Is it kind of inspiring or is it, you know, an example to you that you look at these lads now, they've, you know, you played against them last year, they've gone on and now they're playing senior inter-county football and they're not just playing, like they're playing big roles in senior setups. Does that give you confidence that you can do the same in the future? Yeah, well, I think it would, but then again, I think if a lot of counties are different in comparison to Dublin. So, for example, you'll see last year the Brian O'Leary, Lee Gannon, and Kieran Arch were all called into the Dublin Development Squad. So, in normal terms, in probably a normal county, like Jacqueline, like Matthew Tierney, they went straight to the Galway senior team. In my opinion, it probably drives a little bit of the hunger out of the lads. I reckon Lee, Archer, Gannon, all these kind of lads would be taking probably a year or two where they might not see as much game time as they'd like. But then again, they're in the gym, they're on the platform. And then again, it's all about just progression, progression, progression. It keeps lads tuned in. It keeps the selection and variety of lads probably uh, a lot bigger than what you'd think again. But yeah, it's 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 definitely interesting. Like I'd love to see, let's say, Josh Bannon, in my opinion, Mark Dara Cannon out of the game that day. It doesn't mean Josh Bannon's going to go up and play senior straight away. Again, he's put on the platform, the progressive, the development squad, and then hopefully in, in, in a year or two years or three years, you see him play and you think, you know what, he has all the attributes that he was probably, I wouldn't say missing, but lacking or could have improved on. And hopefully I, 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 can, I can get into that section, that environment and that culture. Um, but again, it's... It's just, I think it's, if you want something bad enough in life, you either have to make a decision and every decision you make, it either brings you one step towards your goal or one step away from it. And that's every single decision you make on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, definitely. And after that year, obviously, you've moved into what is your third and final year now as an under-20 footballer. And you looked very, very sharp in the game against Wicklow. Obviously, you got that goal you know, which was a very individual, you know, superb goal. And at what stage did you have goal on your mind? What was the point where, or did it kind of just open up for you? I think we, we were kind of looking at the, the way we club played and we, we knew that if we, if we could get them a relatively fast speed of transition um, and a diagonal ball, we knew that the two cornerbacks probably weren't the two strongest lads in the team. But again, you, it's kind of something you can rehearse and you can rehearse, you can rehearse. But again, football is one of the most unpredictable things. Um, if it was predictable, we'd all we all be winning all Ireland's all the time. Um, it was just, I think, that matter of time that there was two lads, and I think it was the time that I took the bounce and the solo probably helped. And I thought actually initially Luke Swan or someone could have been at the back post, and I just pop a little fist pass to them, and they'd put it in the back of the net, and I didn't see anyone. And, I just kept the head down running and all of a sudden one thing led to another and it opened up. I thought even possibly if worse comes to worse, like I failed here. But yeah, I, th- I think it was, if you actually look at it as well, I think it's one of the most, um, I suppose, under-mentioned things in GAA now is the width. If you look at teams, a lot of teams out there, especially in the, the, the lower divisions, uh, chasing the ball, chasing the ball. Nine out of ten times, I know I won't get the ball. It's selfless run. It's to take a man out. It's to make space. Uh, it's to create a shot for someone, to create assist for someone. But again, without lads doing that types of role and that dirty work, someone else can't have the the pot of goal at the end. So it's it's a hard role. It can be a frustrating role to play sometimes a wing forward. But again, like I'm playing there since probably minor, and that's the second goal I've probably got. So again, two goals in what three years, four years. So. It takes time, yeah. There's no no rush to it, but again, it's all about progress. Yeah, and definitely, like, you sound like you've really taken on that kind of selfless attitude, which is very apparent in the Dublin senior setup. You know, that was cultivated by Pat Gilroy when he took over and then taken to a new level by Jim Gavin. Was that definitely, you know, immersed in news when you were growing up playing minor and under 20? Like, if there was anyone on the team who had, you know, a massive ego would that player have struggled to fit in with the team? Um, well, I think it's a mixture of things. I think, first of all, like if you're in a group of lads and you have, let's say, a huge ego and there's a difference, there is a fine difference between confidence and ego, but 
if you're not, let's say, if you're not included in things that the team are doing, probably that person notices themselves. And secondly, you're going to look at analysts on the match. So you're looking at the opposing team and you're going to look at clips of them and then you're going to look at clips of ourselves. If you're on a projector in a hall for the 30, 40 players plus management, so you're looking at the guts of 50, 60 people and they see the same fella taking the same shot that's probably not going over at the time or maybe in some days it will, some days it won't. It can be quite brutal to be that person probably being called out. So I think, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it'll only get you so far. Gaelic is the type of game now that there's so many different attributes needed to get away with the same thing twice. Um, so if you look at even the 20s game we played in a friendly there in Cavan, we scored 3-10 in the first half and there wasn't one forward or two of the midfielders who didn't have a score or a play. So I think that does really um, show that football is probably going selfless in a way, which probably it probably suits players that are less skillful and more athletic. Um, so it, it probably yeah, probably suits me slightly slightly better anyways. Yeah, no, no, definitely it is getting more selfless. You can see it in every team that, you know, getting the, the ball to the guy who's in the best position to take the shot is seems to be the mantra for every team. But of course now you're going into the Whitehall seniors then when you're on the under twenties and you're coming in as, you know, Sean Fawn, the, the Dublin minor, the Dublin under twenty, and now you're coming into the Whitehall seniors. You know, obviously a team that is in the A Championship, the Senior Championship. Did you feel, was it an element of a, a blessing or a curse? Or was it a burden to come in as a, a Dublin player? Did you feel like you had more to live up to? Or, you know, were you very quickly made to, you know, were you very quickly nurtured into the team by the senior players? Um, yeah, I suppose made my debut against St. Mary's of Sagart last or two years ago I think it would have been now yeah I don't know I suppose it was a nice opportunity to actually get involved because we were division two at the time I think we just come up or whatever and yeah it was definitely I suppose definitely a different ball game completely uh, the speed of transition and stuff like that is a lot faster I think I think overall I think it's a privilege that I come in and on after playing probably at, at the highest level I, I could but saying that is that it, it doesn't really mean much until you're probably marking someone that's twice the height of you, unless you're marking someone that's twice as fast as you. And um, from a different county, like if you think some of these lads are 28, 29, and they're they're at their peak at the moment, um, physically, it's a different type of hitting hard. It's a different type of running. It's a different type of tacking and dragging. It's it's a different type of game completely, and um, probably as well. People don't know. I wouldn't say it's specific roles individually. So there can be a bit of ball watching, a bit of ball chasing. Try to get on the ball. Um, but then you look at the likes of Bally Moon Kickham's Bally Bowden. It's all the selfless things that are done off the ball. Only one per- person out of 30 can have the ball in their hands. So if you can affect the play or affect the ball when you're not in possession, I think that's what that's to me, anyways, that would be an indication of a real, a real player that, that, that is a team player and that cares about the, the end product. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, so that brings us right up to the present day. Then, of course, you know, right where we are. You've come a long way in your career already. And, yeah, simply put, what what do you want the future to hold for you? Yeah, um, I suppose it's a question I'd, I'd have quite often myself. I think I've mentioned it probably four or five times now, but balance, life balance, and that's what it's all about. Um. I'll actually, there's a really, really good podcast I listened to the other day. Roy Dwyer sent it on to me. It's uh, Tyson Fury, and it's about how he's the, the quote is, whether you're the heavyweight champion of the world, a regular businessman, or a nine-to-five worker, it's all irrelevant as long as you're content. So he, he, he lives by contentment is the most important thing in life. It doesn't matter what you do, what you earn, so whether you're content. Would I like to play Dublin senior football, of course, I would, yeah. But if it meant that everything else in my work life, social life, or whatever, was probably being was failing, um, I'd probably have to assess it then and weigh up the pros and cons. But yeah, that my aim would be now within the next probably three years to break into that development squad and to just slowly but just understand. I probably like to, I'd like to learn the game better. 
Um, I think football is like a subject in school. There's patterns to it. There's sequences to it. There's areas of play that happen repetitively in games, whether it be junior C, senior A, inter-county, all these patterns of play and sequences are happening again and again and again. There could be chunks of space on certain pitches that are always unoccupied. And so if you can notice that, you can adapt to when you're playing, how are you going to get into that space? How are you going to affect the play in that part, I suppose, is is, is really important. Um, I'd like to own my own company someday, which I will, no doubt about it. And I think the main thing, like I said, is just it's just being content and, and, and having that right balance of of life, football, social, and everything in between. Yeah, definitely. Well said. And just before we wrap up, I have a few obviously questions that were submitted on by you know followers of the page. Just quick fire questions. Have you any rituals? Or routines before a big game, anything that kind of settles the nerves. Yeah, I suppose the only superstition I'd have, it's kind of a bit of an odd one. Uh, every game day, I'd cut the grass and water it, and that'd be the last. It's like a really like a mindset trigger that that's all the preparation is done. It's all about enjoying. It. That's just it's a weird one now, but again, it's it's just it's a sign that when I'm leaving the house, everything is done. That's it. Enjoy it. Yeah. Um, who is the toughest opponent you've ever faced? Obviously, as you've gone up, the levels have gone up in opponents that you've faced. Who is the one that really stands out as, God, he was a tough guy to be marked by? Mm, um, do, 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 do. Mark O'Leary from Crokes is extremely tough uh, middle of the field. Uh, probably say Rory Dwyer is definitely up there at wing back. Yeah, I, I would definitely say it would, would be internal, would be the person, the hardest person to mark if that makes sense, rather than probably a different county. Yeah, because they yeah. know you inside and out. Yeah, and definitely in club matches, you know, it's it's definitely got that bit more of an edge to it as well. 100%. Yeah, David Rooley would probably be up there as well, because he's, he's my worst nightmare. He's small and he's, he's nippy and he's fast, whereas I'd rather mark someone probably that's slightly bigger. Yeah, yeah, I've been marked by David as well. He's a uh... He's a very, very fast tackler as well. Like he, he can take the ball off you before you even realise. Um, what was a harder standard to adapt to? Was it Dublin under 20 or senior club football? Definitely Dublin under 20s. I think senior football, you probably have that time to give, give an extra solo in. I think I think it was just because, thankfully, physically, I probably wasn't 100 miles off the senior physic, physical levels. But I suppose in terms of the 20s, you you would very rarely have time to take more than two hops or two solos of the ball, and there'd be someone breathing down your neck or, or, or high intensive pressure. So yeah, I would I would think that Dublin under twenty was more difficult to adapt to. Yeah, and what would you say right now is the biggest the biggest challenge you've ever overcome so far in your career? <sighs> probably think it would be probably be last year the All Ireland when you're so close, I suppose. Everyone was just, everyone was known that there was probably, I think we had, we counted 94 training sessions last year. That was between all the COVID and the breaks and the preseason, the tests. And you think you've 94 training sessions. Then you think you've all your individual gym sessions, you have your recovery sessions. You have to pack your bag, plan your meals, plan your way to training. It's just, I suppose, again, it's, it's trying to find the balance of mental energy and physical energy and to f- try to find the right balance to put in. And then obviously the gap of COVID, I think it just turned lads off football. There's nothing really quite appealing of playing the week before Christmas in the all Ireland final when you would, would hope that it would be late August or September on a sunny day in, in Crow Park. So yeah, that would definitely be. And then obviously not starting or even getting on or coming off the bench on the all Ireland final day was a bit of a kick in the teeth. But again, it just, it makes you, some players crumble under that kind of thing. I, I look at it as, okay, why didn't I and question it and learn from it, progress from it and drive on if you really want it. If you really want something in life, you have to go and chase it. That's that's as simple as it is. Yeah. Um, which coaches have helped you the most in your game to improve? Which coaches have you learned the most under? Yeah, uh, I'd, say, I'd say there's not one coach that definitely – Gave me all the answers for everything. I think that's again that's the joy of it. I think it's a it's a puzzle. 
like I've said ridiculous amount of times, every coach has something to offer, I think. And if you look at, if you take everything with a pinch of salt, so for example, Sean Hogan at Minor, uh, he taught me, I suppose, the calmness and the relaxation of before going into a game. He, he only used to say two or three words and he just says, just hurl, Sean. That's all he said. And it was something so simple, I suppose. But I never got hyped up for games. I didn't need to. I probably went out and enjoyed them more. If he had something to say, he'd say that training on Tuesday or Thursday. And he'd say it in a way that he understood how I dealt with things rather than roar and probably in the sideline, which I would have got frustrated about. Um, Carol Bean from Fingalians, and he's involved with the 20s as a skills coach, definitely picks up on the smaller, finer details. Jason Sherlock definitely helped with the progressive uh, development and the enjoyment of football. Then you'd have lads like Andy Cullen, uh, Paul O'Brien from DCU, and Lee Murphy from the Whitehall 2000s, which have kind of put an emphasis on the the dirty ball, the big tackles, the, the work rate and stuff like that. So I suppose if you actually put all these little elements together, um, again, you're trying to create this picture of trying to find a balance of what do you think is what you need going into a game. And maybe some days you see it in the dressing room all the time. Some lads like to listen to their own music, and read a book, you can. Some lads like to nearly be punching the wall um, and listening to to stupidly loud music before going out and nearly going out as if it's a it's a boxing match. So, yeah, then you have the likes of, I suppose, even Enda Brady and Erdogan Kelly. It's a whole thing of, it's just enjoyment. And they, they, they really put that emphasis. And I don't think if I didn't have that at such a young age and, or how to control probably aggression, I, I don't think that I probably would have, wouldn't have, wouldn't, the sport wouldn't have appealed to me as much as if, as the, if the enjoyment wasn't there. So, I think it's a right mix of all them little ingredients from every little bit of co- coaching that I did get. And thankfully, there's 101 other coaches and mentors now that I haven't named, but they would be the ones that, I suppose, would stand out to me. Yeah, definitely. Like every coach definitely has an influence on the player that you go on to become. Was there, was there a moment that you can remember where, you know, for the first time in your career, you really bit down on the gum shield, if you like, and said, no, I'm not losing this game. And you really dug in and you realised you almost kind of surprised yourself in what you could do. I'd say, I think the, the, the hurling game we played, I think it was 2000 and 2000, and maybe it was 15 or 16. It would have been, uh, we played Scaries Harps. I think it was out in Peregrine's ground. It was the championship final. I think that was probably my best individual game that day. I think I scored, 14 points or something, but I was hitting freeze as well. Yeah, we, I remember, I we, we gave them a cricket score of a game, but I, I think from the very, it's one of the games from the very first ball. I, I just, I don't know, I suppose I just felt it in control. It was probably a bit of luck as well that helped me, but yeah, I suppose that was the, the one day. Then you have the likes of the minor A championship final and um, games against Crokes all over the years, probably. I just, I think enjoyment, that's, that's probably something that's it's not mentioned enough. And I think that that is the most, that's why we're all here at the end of the day. If you're not, you wouldn't do a job you don't like for years on years. So why would you play a sport that you're given so much time to if you're not going to enjoy it, if that makes sense? Yeah, definitely. And if there is someone now who wants to play for, you know, of course, the Dublin Miners, the Dublin Under 20s, or Dublin, you know, get to the best level that they can get to in the future, would you have any, you know, what would the best advice you'd have for them be? Um, the best advice I think as as cliche as it sounds I think if you really work like I've seen lads that have have had very little natural talent every decision you make it's going to either lead you one step forward one step back so they say basically the high performance athletes for example make high performance decisions every single day and that starts off with things you can control things that are in your circle so you, you dictate if you want to get a good eight hours sleep. You dictate if you want to go to the gym. You dictate if you want to go football, if you want to eat healthy, um, who you hang around with and what you do when you're off time or what you do when you're chilling out time. Or, I suppose you have to be enjoying it as well. So I suppose if you, if you could find a balance, but you have to understand as well, I could give a really, really good piece of advice on what's worked for me. But again, the beauty of it is that it's so unpredictable. Someone else could do the complete opposite of what I say and become the best player. I would think the balance of enjoyment and hard work and just any job you do on or off the field 
just small details, small margins. Give it all. Don't let any job half done. If you're going to do something, do it fully committed, um, fully belief, fully back yourself. And, and if you're not going to do that, uh, maybe it's 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 not the right time for you. Maybe it's not the right sport for you. But I would definitely just say, just you have to pretend, you have to be obsessed with something. You have to, you have to prioritize that like your life depends on if you really want something. Because I know, looking at it now, I'm definitely not the most um, skillful footballer, by not by a country mile, but I would I would argue that I'm one of the wor- most hardworking. And the way GA has evolved and the way it's gone, you look at the the condition, some of the high performance athletes are in. If you if you can actually just become an athlete, if you can become an athlete, you're fifty percent there. Fifty percent is running, fifty percent is football. If you look at it that way, or even break it down less, how many how many touches? The average player has, I think, is something like between 37 and 45 seconds in the ball a game. So if you look at all that time you're not going to spend on the ball, what else can you do? You can run. You can work on your running then. You can work on your sleeping. You can nail the very, very basic things. And then, again, it's all a puzzle. No one will ever get the final picture out of it. But, again, it's progress over perfection. And that would be my that would be my last bit of advice, just progress over perfection. Well said. All right. Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. No, thanks a million for having me on, Shay. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed listening to that episode of the Play On podcast. Make sure you take care.